Up next is Nick Young, staff engineer from VMware, talking about how many cube cuddles or cube CTLs is a key metric that codifies the usability of any set of CRDs and suggests some guidelines for CRD authors to manage this metric and improve the user experience of their CRDs. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Troubleshooting Kubernetes CRDs is Too Damn Hard, or How Many Cube Cuddles Does It Take to Fix a Kate's Problem? So my name is Nick Young. Uh, I am the tech lead for Contra and Ingress Controller for Kubernetes. Um, Contra is relevant to this sort of CRD discussion because we've had two CRDs across the course of our lifetime. Um, the first one was uh, the Ingress Route CRD, which is now deprecated and replaced with the HTTP Proxy CRD. Um, so we learned a lot as part of doing that. Uh, and I have you, I and the other, the rest of the people on the team have uh, made a bunch of mistakes uh, with HTTP Proxy as well. But I'm, I'm hoping you can learn something from. Uh, I'm also a maintainer on the uh, Gateway API project, um, which is um, a project to use a set of CIDs to improve the ingress and service experience. So you know, in this talk, you know, I talk a lot about uh, Contours CID, HTTP Proxy, and the Gateway API and ingress, because that's the stuff I know well. But most of this should be broadly applicable to any uh, CID. So level, level set though, what are CIDs? Yeah, well, they're custom resource definitions. You, know, you can Google that, obviously, but you know they're, they're the way that you can extend Kubernetes by having making your own object and your own controller to reconcile them. Yeah, and because it's, it makes the, it's so easy to extend Kubernetes, this is why everybody's doing them. You know, so lots of projects are using this sort of thing now. Um, and so I wanted to talk a little bit about what's the experience of using one of these. So you grab the new thing, comes with CRDs, awesome. You try it out, maybe you instantiate one of the CRDs, you know, everything does what it says, great. However, what happens if you make a mistake with that CRD? You know, what do you do? Well, for me, usually what I do is go and Q kettle get the thing, maybe with an OYAML to check out, um, to see if there's any useful information in there. Maybe sometimes a, a Q kettle describe as well. But the thing is, how many times do you need to type Q kettle to figure out what's broken? You know, I can, I'm going to show this, uh, you know, I'm not going to throw stones at anyone else uh, and show this with my own stuff. Uh, you know, I'm going to, you know, break a HTTP proxy. So here's one I may prepared earlier. And uh, in this cluster, I have a bunch of HTTP proxy objects, one of which is invalid. You can see here, this one says invalid. You, so... Obviously, you know, if I just kubectl get again, I'm just going to get that same um, stuff that's in that line. So I'm going to kubectl get proxy TLS, TLS, TLS example, and then just output it in YAML. And you can see down here that we've got a that we've got a status stanza and some conditions and an error. Aha! Spec virtual host TLS secret test secret is valid secret not found. Now, so what that means is, you know, this test secret here doesn't exist. Um, note that you can also, you can also describe a proxy secret and end up with the same with the same info. So yeah, and uh, uh, describe is really good at uh, rendering uh, this sort of status bar. So. You can see here that you know, for, keep, for HTTP proxy, you know, for a sim very simple HTTP proxy like this with a simple problem, it's only taken like two kubectl commands uh, to, to figure out what the problem was. However, even with HTTP proxy, it's possible to have much more complicated things that are gonna take you more. You know, if you, because HTTP proxy lets you include other HTTP proxies inside it, you, know, you can then add another sort of N HTTP proxy commands where N is how many HTTP proxies you have included inside one another. Also, you can have problems with service, with secrets like that, you know, lots of other things. So you, like, I think here I've shown you a pretty easy one, but ideally, you know, I, it feels like the more of those you do, the more QCode commands you have to do, the worse off you're going to be. So when I was writing this talk originally, um, the way that I would like to talk about this is uh, to, that it was the number of QCodes to understanding. But uh, the more I talk, the more I worked on this talk, the more I've thought about it, the more I realized that's just a rubbish name. You know, I think that a uh, much better name is the troubleshooting distance. So what is the troubleshooting distance? It's how far do you have to travel conceptually between when you start fixing something and when you figure out what's wrong? Obviously, this is a pretty broad statement, but I think in terms of Kubernetes, it's 
how many Q kettles do you need to do to understand what's broken? You, maybe you're not using Qbetal, maybe you're using some other UI or something like that. But in any case, it's a fair proxy for you how far you have to go to understand what's broken. Why is this troubleshooting distance idea important though? Well, I think it roughly approximates the usability of your set of CRDs. And you, that is the greater the troubleshooting distance, the worse or the less usable your CRDs are. It's not only how many Q kettles you need to do, it's also that the more Q kettles you need to do, the more it sort of shows that, you, that you've got steps to jump through to get to understanding where your thing is. The more that you can bring information in and keep that troubleshooting distance lower, the tighter and more easy to understand your model is as well. Yeah, and I think though that a CRD system, including a, the controller is a contract where you can request something and the controller will go off and reconcile it and then tell you what happened. And, but if you don't have a place for the controller to put the information to tell you what happened, then it's gonna be really hard for you to figure it out a lot of the time. So in some ways, the CRDs are like RPCs. You, there's a lot that this, uh, that this analogy elides, but in some ways it's true. So for most CRDs, you have a spec and a status. Now you should have these probably, there are circumstances in which it's better not to, but they are very limited. And in general, if you're making a CRD, you should do this. Spec is the request for something, and then status is the result. It's that simple. But so lots of CRDs and core objects have carefully designed specs, but status is much less so. So a good example of what not to do is the original ingress object. So the original ingress object, it lets you describe how mainly HTTP traffic can get into your cluster. Let's you configure the domain name, you know, some routes and prefixes that you can forward to separate services. So you can split up prefixes, you can split up paths and send them out to separate services. But, and so spec has lots of information, lots of stuff you can do, but status is sparse. You know? So here's an example. So this is the spec or the metadata and the spec of the thing. You can see you've got a HTTP bin, .yongnik.dev is the host name. It gets forwarded out to the service HTTP bin and there's a TLS details there as well. So all of this is stuff that you need to know to be able to configure the service. But if we look at the status, the only thing you've got is what IP address you should access this thing on. So, you know, I mean, that is vital information, vital information. You, the whole idea of this uh, stanza is that it means that if you create your ingress, you can then use this IP address to say, if I uh, CNAME httpbn.youngnit.dev to this IP address, then my, then my request will end up at the right place and everything will be routed correctly and the, user age, the host header will all match up. But it doesn't tell me anything about what happens if it goes wrong. You know, if I make a mistake in the service and the service doesn't exist, what happens? Well, nothing gets configured. This, this status will actually get configured because the, you know, well, depending on the implementation, this may get configured or it may not, but I won't have any way to know that it was the, the service that I broke that I made a mistake on without looking at doing something like looking at the logs of the ingress controller or some other way but there's just nowhere on the object to actually put that information. And so that's one. Of, that's why I say this is what not to do. You know, the ingress is a really important object that has historically been vital for bringing, for bringing people's traffic into, into Kubernetes. Obviously I'm an ingress controller maintainer, right? Like I get paid for this, you know, but, and so I, I shouldn't underestimate or understate how important ingress is, but you know, there's a lot that we can learn about how to do better. I, I think, uh, a friend of mine has a really good way of saying this is that if you break someone with ingress, you've then got to solve the murder mystery of exactly what it is you broke. You know, and you know, that's a lot of the time that it comes down to just trial and error and knowing the possible things you could break. And I think we can do better. So what I'm saying is that when you're designing your CRDs, you need to consider the unhappy path too. You know, it's vital that you consider the happy path, obviously, you know, especially around API guarantees and making sure that everything in the happy path works and that you don't break people as you add new features. But it, the usability of the CIDs comes from how much you've considered the unhappy path. And again, that comes back to the troubleshooting distance. You know, if you haven't considered the unhappy path and the troubleshooting distance is going to be really high for something like ingress, the troubleshooting distance can effectively be unbounded because no matter how many kubectl commands you get, you put in, you may not be able to get the information out that you need. And I don't think that's an ideal place. So how can we do better? You know, it's all about that status. It's all about the results of the reconciliation. So let's go over some top tips. And these top tips are based on my own experience with working with CIDs a lot. 
So the API guidelines are your friend. These are the API guidelines for the core uh, API objects, but they're applicable to CRDs as well. Now, the important parts out of this very long URL are it's Kubernetes org, community repo, and it's under SIG architectures uh, rubric, and it's the API conventions document. Now, it makes two sort of big statements about status. Use the conditions pattern for adding an extensible standard list of conditions and objects is affected by at any time. And for more specific information that records the output of the request from the spec, use specific fields, you know, like use fields that have that exact information. So let's talk about specific fields first, because there's a lot more to talk about with conditions. So for specific fields, you know, they should record the result of the request from the spec or other important information. So in the case of you HTTP proxy, you we have we only have a couple of specific fields. We have the uh, the address that you can reach the HTTP proxy on, and then a couple of fields that tell you the uh, status of it, which are basically pre condition precursors to conditions. Um, and I think other objects will often have things like that. So for example, you know, IP addresses. Uh, the pod uh, the pod object in its status has the request the IP address of the host and of the pod. The pod also has a cause class, so that's a burstable, uh, guaranteed, or uh, best effort. You know, and that's like what class of service should the pod expect in respect to its CPU and memory. The node uh, has an images slice that has a that's a slice of all of the images, the container images that are present on the node, and it also has a node info uh, object which shows you all of, a bunch of in, uh, important information about the nodes. So this is all stuff that's like you need to know. Um, but it's not like a state that the object is in. It's like an important property of the object as a result of the request that you have made in the spec. So um, that, let's contrast that with conditions where conditions are a level triggered description of various things affecting the thing an object represents. So they're an extensible way to add status info that's easily consumed by both humans and tooling. So you know, what we're talking about here is you know, the important thing here is level triggered. These are states of the object. They're not... Um, you and they should be handled as a thing as a terminal state for the object. You know, there here you can see an example of what we're talking about with the node object. We've got a bunch of conditions on here. You know, uh, we've got like you know kernel deadlock, read-only file system, memory pressure, disk pressure, PID pressure. These are all things where the, the node has moved into some state where someone's probably going to need to do something. Um, you know. Uh, memory pressure, maybe that one is a little different. It might flip between itself based on based on what the pods are actually doing. But stuff like corrupt Docker overlay two, someone's going to go and need to have a look at that node and figure out what's going on or throw it away or something. But that needs an action that is not coverable. Um, the ready condition is a is a good example of what I what we call a positive polarity condition. I'll talk more about that. So, so let's talk about rules for conditions. Um, as part of the upstream spec, the, the conditions have a bunch of fields that they must have. They must have a type, which is a camel case name for the condition. You can see that before with things like memory pressure. You know, and then they must have a status, which is one of true, false, or unknown. Now, true and false are pretty obvious. So in the case of memory pressure, true means that there is memory pressure. False means there's no memory pressure. However, unknown is really important. And then it means a controller hasn't been able to determine this value yet. So I mean, this is important because Kubernetes is an eventually consistent system. And so a lot of the time when your controller first sees something, it may not know what, it's, what it has to do yet, or it may do, need to do something that might take a long time in human time. And so in that case, it should immediately write the condition as unknown because it doesn't know yet if uh, something has happened. So you know, maybe the when the kubelet is starting up and it needs to write some conditions back to the API server, it doesn't know yet if there's memory pressure on the node. So it can put memory pressure unknown until it finds out that no, there's no memory pressure and write it and change it to false. And so, but every time it updates it, there should be a reason. Now, so the reason might be, you know, uh, memory pressure false because memory okay. You know, that's fine. But yeah, you know, if the memory pressure is true, it could just be, you know, hey, too many things have happened or, you know, a specific pod is using all the um, using all the memory or something like that, and so the reason is there to to give you something to look at, a short description that's uh, no spaces that uh, tells you what is what um, you know what's the reason. Um, and the important part here is this one's sort of intended to be human readable but more machine consumable. Uh, the message field is more human readable representation of the reason field. So it can be long. It's you know it's it's allowed to have spaces and punctuation and full sentences. And it's intended that 
you know, maybe the reason field might be, you know, spec error, but then the spec, but then the message will have the exact field in the spec that has the error or something like that. The last thing that's a, that's a compulsory is the transition time, which is when the time, when the object, when the condition last transition to the state that it currently is written as. So true, false, or unknown. Um, the, the one that I would argue we should also, that you should also always include is the observed generation, which contains the metadata generation field that the object was when the condition changed state. So metadata generation is created by the API server on any object every time the spec is edited on the API server. And so the, the purpose of this serves is it's like a checksum that uh, the condition that you're looking at is applicable to the latest version of the object. Because again, eventually a consistent system, you can't be sure unless you have something like this, that the condition is relevant to the latest version. And so that's why I think you should always use these as a CID author. Um, so other recommendations aside from use the observed generation are in general, con conditions should mostly represent a state that won't change unless the spec does. Um, obviously there are exceptions to that. You know, some of the no conditions are a great example there, um, but in general, it should be like, you are a terminal state where nothing's going to change without a person doing something or without in an action by a human. Um, there should mostly be negative polarity. That's normally pop false. Um, that means they're generally error states like the node network not available, memory pressure conditions, um, other conditions like that, you know, where they could describe an error, you know, or a state where you know, the network unavailable is a good example, or uh, you know, a pod spec error, that sort of thing, or you know, requests requests can't be fulfilled, that sort of thing. Um, I think it's good to have a, a small number, a couple at most, of positive polarity conditions. And these serve as an attention indicator. You know, if the ready condition on a node is false, then that means there's something you need to get more information about. And the more information is actually included in the cube kettle get where you found out the ready is false because it's included in the conditions array. Um, and that's one of the things that keeps that troubleshooting distance I was talking down, uh, talking about down. Uh, other other ones might be valid for things where the controller is doing like a syntactic check um, of the thing. There's other ways you can do that as well. You know, ideally you're using um, uh, validation webhooks uh, and you know sort of open API validation to make sure that invalid stuff can't get in. But sometimes if you've got a more complicated system, you need to do more complicated check. Okay, so. Unless you really know what you're doing though, you should use the upstream condition struct and not try to add any fields or anything to it. Um, don't make your own copy like I did. And I'll show you that in a minute. So let's talk examples. Let's talk HTTP proxy. Okay, so here we go. Here is HTTP proxies uh, details. This is just, I'm showing you the status struct here. Um, the spec is further up. Um, so, in the HTTP proxy status, we've got, you know, as I said, current status and description. These are actually almost, these are actually 100% analogous to the reason and message uh, of conditions. Uh, you know, we had mostly pretty much the same thing, except in HTTP proxy, this is only ever valid, invalid, or orphaned. Um, <clears throat> so, and then we've got the load balancer um, stanza, which is a carbon copy of the one from. Uh, Ingress, it actually even uses the same uh, struct. Uh, but then we've got uh, an array of detailed conditions. Now, these detailed conditions were sort of my idea to make this whole thing a little easier, but it's one of those things where I don't think it succeeded at all. I think, um, yeah, this was my design and I fully own the fact that I made a mistake here. Um, so what uh, detailed conditions are is their conditions. You can see that it's inlined here, but uh, conditions with an errors and a warnings stanza so that you know, for any condition, you can say here are all of the errors and here are all of the warnings that led to us creating that condition. The thing that I was trying to hit here is that you can have a valid condition, but there might be some warnings that aren't fatal for processing that, that you know, so they're warnings like warnings in a log file. Um, but I think that the thing that is a problem here is that we've got this sort of subcondition thing. It's a specialized way of doing this and you, the, all of that information could be better stored as top level conditions. And that's the sort of the way that everything else works. So I tried to be clever here and I've tried to be too clever. Um, so, I mean, it doesn't work that badly in practice. Like in what you've seen that it does end up with the, um, the uh, errors that you get. And um, the, you know, you can see here that you've got like errors it says like see errors for details, which is not great, right? Like that means that you can't just see what the problem is. 
Um, so the if you actually do the OYAML thing though, um, the um, what we're uh, what you can see though is you get the errors array, you get the full errors away anyway. So, you know, but I just don't think there's functionally enough difference here to justify the the change that we went through. Okay, let's have a look at something where we've done it a bit better. Obviously, you know, I'm involved in this. I've been trying to take some of the stuff I learned from doing HTTP proxy and make it better. And so, I think uh, we've done a bit better there. So let's have a look at. Sorry. Gateway status is here. So gateway status has, um, I guess I should talk a little bit more about the gateway itself first. So let's have a look at the gateway spec. So gateway spec, a gateway in the gateway API is the thing that translates between stuff outside the cluster and stuff inside the cluster. Um, and so gateways have addresses, which is the IP addresses the, that they listen on. And they have listeners, which are sort of a logical construct that surrounds like the port essentially. So it's a port uh, combined with a protocol and some TLS details. Um, and so you, uh, a gateway can have multiple addresses and for each address, every listener is bound to every address. So you, know, you can have a gateway that listens on port 80 and port 443 on 10 different addresses and you'll end up with like, you know, a list listeners bound to each of those addresses functionally, but there'll only be actually two listeners configured. So the important part here is that you've got like a listener and addresses, you know, and that's what the gateway is trying to do. So in the status for the gateway, we have an addresses field, which is an example of the field status that I was talking about before, where it shows you the IP addresses that you've asked for and well, it shows you the IP addresses you've actually gotten, not the IP addresses you've asked for, those are in the spec, but it shows you the IP addresses that have actually been allocated. So if for some reason some addresses couldn't be allocated, as long as one is allocated, then they'll all show. Then that one will show up here. Now the conditions here at the gateway level describe like the top level uh, status of the gateway as a whole, and that means like you know, have you made any syntax errors? The gateway seems to be valid. It's associated with a gateway class. You know, the addresses were able to be allocated. That sort of thing. However, we split the status for the listeners out into their own object because there's a lot of information in the, in the listeners. And a lot of it varies between the protocols. So uh, one thing that I didn't know, show you in the spec is that each listener in the gateway has a name. And so, you know, obviously in the status, we use that name to make, to make it so that you can check which ones are which. Now, so here we've got like supported kinds, which is like what kinds um, can be attached to this gateway. We've got how many routes have been attached. And then we've got a conditions array as well. And so what I think we're doing here is when you get the gateway status, you'll get the status of the overall gateway, but then you'll get the status of each individual listener and you know, which, it, which addresses are configured and all that sort of stuff. And so the idea here is that it only takes you one kubectl get, one get command to actually get all of this information in one go. The corollary to that obviously is that you've got to be careful about how much stuff you put in here. That's why we are very, very, very conservative at the moment with, how, with max items and how many items we can have in these things. Obviously we'll increase these if we need to, but the idea is that we want this to be, um, we want this to be, uh, you pullable down in one operation without the without the object being ridiculously big. All right, so let's talk conclusions. So for your troubleshooting distance, you know, it's you know in Kubernetes, it's how many kubectl uh, commands it takes to get there to to figure out what the the cause of your problem is. Try to keep it low. You know, think about how many kubectl commands it'll take to troubleshoot. You know, and that this goes double, triple, or more, the more objects are in your CID system. For gateway API, we've got gateway class, gateway, routes, different types of routes, uh, and then they, and then the services that back onto it as well. And there are a bunch of other objects as well. And so like the more objects you have in the system, the more important that it is that each one shows you as much information as possible about itself to try and make it so you don't have to do too many round trips to the API server to figure out what's going on. So when you're designing your CRDs, use status, add result, has the result information into the status, have specific info into, into specific fields, but use a standard conditions field to hold that sort of standard information about the thing, including errors. You know, include the observed generation to check for staleness uh, and Try and use mostly negative polarity conditions with a small number of positive polarity summaries. Use the upstream meta v1 condition uh, unless you unless you know what you're doing. So that's that's what I got to say. I think 
the troubleshooting distance idea in my mind is you know, is pretty interesting one and i really like love to talk to people more about it um, thanks for your time uh, as i said before i'm nick young uh, i'm a staff engineer at vmware and i'm uh, reachable on uh, twitter github and kubernetes slack as at young nick oh and cncf slack as well thanks very much and uh, great to talk to you Thanks to Microsoft Azure and Equinix Metal for supporting us at the champion level. We also want to thank Red Hat and Slim.ai for funding us at our supporter level.